All right, hi everyone and welcome to the MIT Robotics Seminar. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker. Today we have uh, Professor Florian Schkerti, who is visiting us. Florian is a professor in computer science at the University of Toronto. Uh, he's also a faculty member in the Robotics Institute at the University of Toronto. Uh, he's a member of the Acceleration Consortium and is also a faculty affiliate at the Vector Institute. Uh, Florian's lab develops lots of cool methodologies uh, spanning uh, planning and perception for robotics, with particular focus on enabling robot operation in dynamic environments and alongside humans. He applies his work, you're going to see some of that, uh, to a number of cool application scenarios ranging from mobile manipulation to chemistry, which I thought was very creative and original. And uh, of course, Florian got like a number of awards. Among those, I want to mention the Alexander Graham Bell Doctoral Award, uh, Amazon Research Award in Robotics, the Connaught New Researcher Award, in the TRI uh, Young Faculty Researcher Award. So let's welcome Florian. All right. So thanks so much for the generous introduction, Luca. And thanks so much for the hospitality uh, that everyone showed today. It was amazing to speak to uh, all the people I met today. Um, so I'm Florian Schurti. I'm going to be talking about uh, task and motion planning, how to learn and how to perceive for uh, TAMP. Uh, and it is fitting to talk about TAMP at MIT because it, it has been pioneered uh, here quite a bit. Um, and let's see, uh, I'm looking forward to the, to the type of feedback that I'm going to receive and the type of criticisms that I'm going to receive about this work. I'm looking forward to the, to the discussions after this uh, talk. So um, the research agenda in my lab has three main uh, directions. One of them has to, do about, um, has to do with autonomous robots for scientific data collection. So this is the classic field robotics. When you send a robot in the wild, you want it to come back with uh, useful data for scientists. So issues like visual attention, visual search, and exploration are really important here. Um, I'm also interested in and in working in uh, providing safety guarantees through better simulation. Uh, one particular question that I'm interested in answering here is how do you um, generate adversarial scenarios in simulation such that they have a high probability of actually being adversarial in the real world. So you can test robots in simulation mostly. Um, but the topic that I'm going to focus about, uh, that I'm going to focus on today, is machine learning for planning and control, and in particular, task and motion planning and how to learn how to plan in this setting. So if we look at uh, the main um, themes in search and learning uh, and the middle ground, we're going to observe on, on one side of the spectrum uh, planning at test time methods. Uh, so these methods generalize. They don't necessarily require training data. But uh, often you need to specify symbols or logic or rules. Um, and they are generally slow to plan, not very reactive. They are very open loop. Uh, and I would classify logic geometric programming, uh, PDDL stream, and classic TAMP uh, SMT solving in this category. Um, on the other hand, you have very reactive uh, policies that are trained through imitation or through RL or some combination. Uh, and you generally don't need symbols. Uh, we can talk about whether that's a positive or negative, but you don't need symbols. They're fast, reactive. However, they only generalize within the training set uh, or some uh, combinations thereof. Uh, and they generally do require large data. They require large interactions with uh, the environment. So I'm interested in figuring out what's in the middle uh, of this spectrum. Uh, how does guided planning at test time look like? And this is not the first time that this question is being raised. Uh, Byung Jun Kim, uh, who was a PhD student here, uh, did the large part of his PhD uh, on this topic. Uh, Tom Silver also addressed this uh, question. Um, uh, Yang also has uh, papers in this, uh, doing feasibility uh, planning on this, uh, on this task and motion planning problems. But the, um, the, the main idea here is that you can try to marry the best of bo both worlds. You can get um, generalization, you can train from few data uh, because you're injecting some structure and um, you can make these planners be fast and reactive. I'm putting that as an orange because it's a, it's a big if. Um, but you still need to specify symbols and uh, logic. So not everything has been uh, solved in this area. Um, so the agenda for today is going to be to talk about uh, some small background in sampling-based task and motion planning, just to be sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, then we're going to talk about learning task planning heuristics, both from uh, offline and from online data. And then I'm going to talk about uh, a 
con uh, a relaxation technique uh, that uh, converts the task and motion planning problem into a continuous motion planning problem. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about applications to chemistry lab automation uh, and uh, perception. So it's a big list of things. Uh, let's hope we can uh, go through all of them. Um, let's start with a toy example of uh, TAMP, just to be on the same page. Uh, you have this type of scenario. You want to move um, uh, the green box and the blue box on the goal surface S1. Uh, but uh, you have this gray box that is obstructing. How do you, you need to figure out without being in the specification, you need to figure out that uh, an intermediate goal should be to move this uh, gray box out of the way and then move the original boxes uh, as you wished. Uh, and this is a discrete, this is typically a discrete and continuous uh, um, optimization problem or sampling problem, uh, which um, you know, scales pretty poorly. You have, in a, even in this simple case, you have three objects at least five operations that you have to do on this, you, that you can do on these objects, and you have also the, the joints of the, of the robot and the planning horizon. So it becomes pretty challenging pretty quickly. Um, and some of the most effective approaches for, for task and motion planning uh, generally fall uh, under the umbrella of uh, optimization-based met methods. So LGP is one example, uh, and Another uh, paradigm is uh, sampling-based uh, task and motion planning uh, algorithms. Uh, there is a large literature on this, so this is by no means meant uh, to be uh, inclusive or uh, representative of the field, but those are the two dominant uh, approaches. Um, a, a little bit of boring PDDL terminology, so you have uh, predicates, which are essentially Boolean functions over objects. So for example, is the upper block on top of the lower block? Uh, you have facts, which are uh, predicates that have been evaluated uh, on uh, object tuples. And you have logical states, uh, which are sets of these facts. Uh, for example, you can have an initial state saying that this is the current uh, layout of the world in geometry, and you want the goal states to be, um, uh, to be another logical configuration. And you have uh, these PDDL actions, which are changes of logical state that satisfy some preconditions and uh, effects. So a logical planner is essentially a discrete search methods, m method that uh, transitions through this sequence of actions until you reach your uh, goal state. Um, unfortunately, PDL planners uh, you know, do not know a lot about or anything about the geometry. They're purely logical. So in order to, they're missing information about motion planning, placement uh, poses, inverse kinematics, etc. Uh, which is why in PDL stream, uh, Keelan and uh, uh, Tomas and Leslie uh, essentially created uh, this uh, ability to add continuous um, objects into the, uh, into the PDL framework. So a stream is essentially a conditional generator, a way to sample uh, or a way to optimize, but it, uh, it essentially generates a, a symbol uh, and it certifies certain properties of this symbol. Um, so this creates new symbols and new, new facts as, as needed. Um, and you can, have, you can have streams that do inverse kinematics, grasping, motion planning, collision detection, et cetera. But it's a way to marry the continuous uh, with the discrete. Um, now, if you wanted to sort of summarize how this family of PDL stream planners look like, you would uh, start with a diagram like this. So you start with your initial state at the bottom, uh, at the bottom right. Um, you have a set of facts, some of which are optimistic, I'm going to talk about why, and others are true. And you have this planner that knows nothing about TAMP, is a logical planner only. Uh, and if it's able to find actions to the logical state, you're, you're done, that's great. And if you're later on, if you're able to ground those uh, logical actions into, uh, into continuous space through motion planning, through inverse kinematics, then you're really done. But if, uh, if you're not able to ground these optimistic facts, then perhaps some logical facts are missing and you need to introduce them by actually, by actually calling the uh, streams, by instantiating them. Um, so the streams generate new optimistic facts without actually checking in with the motion planner. They just assume that something is going to be feasible and that makes the whole planning process a bit optimistic and uh, you're able to uh, instantiate uh, when, when necessary. Um, but again, I want to stress that this PDL planner knows nothing is a generic black box uh, logical planner. It knows nothing about the fact that you're trying to solve a TAMP problem. Um, so 
with uh, one of my students, Mohamed Korir, uh, we asked the question, th some of these planners are useful, but they're, they're slow. So can we learn to plan from uh, offline data uh, if we assume that we have solved similar problems? So the idea here is that as you get more planning experience, your planning time should decrease. And the number of problems that you're able to solve should increase. That's, that's what we're hoping to get. And this is related, again, to work that uh, Bem Joom had done during his uh, PhD, but with other uh, methods and other formulations. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's look at, uh, closely at how this, uh, how this can be implemented. So you have this robot arm, the uh, toy example that we started earlier. You can co we convert this into a scene graph with geometric information. So for every object, there is a node. Uh, edges are um, predicates. And this scene graph, which is uh, essentially a representation of the scene, also models the, uh, the target logical state, which are these dashed edges. So you want uh, object B1 to be on surface S1. You want object B0 to be on surface S1 as well by the end of it. Um, then we process this through, through some graph neural network uh, features. And then we, uh, we essentially try to imitate the, the behavior of these streams using neural networks. So these are neural networks that return the same output as the streams uh, returned. But now they also have the output uh, a number, which is uh, the probability of them being relevant to the, uh, to the planning problem. So these are relevant scores for streams. Which streams are relevant, which ones are not? So how do we get supervision for this? How do we train this? Um, we, can, we can actually get a uh, supervision signal from previous problems that the slow, uninformed task and motion planning algorithm has already solved. It can tell you which streams were necessary for the solution and which streams were not. So you get this uh, binary supervision, and you do binary classification on these streams. So if you do this, then you have essentially a relevance predictor for every stream in the, uh, in the system. So now the overall framework looks like uh, orange are all the things that existed before, and we added in gray this uh, model that ranks streams uh, according to their relevance for the problem. Uh, so now instead of going through streams sort of uniformly, uh, you are able to prioritize which streams are more relevant to the uh, problem. And which, which one should you be trying to instantiate first? And uh, this is the obligatory uh, you know, block stacking type of example, which you can solve with this. So the TAMP algorithm still works. It still produces reasonable solutions. Um, but I think the, the more interesting um, uh, thing is uh, the simulation behavior. So we tested this in simulation environments that include clutter environments, uh, non-monotonic problems where you have to undo the progress that you have done and then uh, undo it and then try to make more progress into the problem, so sort of like Towers of Hanoi type of behavior. Uh, sorting problems where you have to cluster uh, boxes according to their color or stacking or cases where you have a lot of distractors. And what we see, adaptive is the, one of the algorithms in the PDL stream uh, family of uh, algorithms that is not informed. And our algorithm, which is informed, if given uh, a, a set uh, number of seconds to find the solution, it finds solutions faster, uh, and it finds more solutions than the, the base algorithm. And uh, we test this generalization with different number of objects in the scene, different initial locations, and different logical uh, goals. And as you can see, not all environments are amenable to uh, learning to search type of approach like, like this. So in the kitchen and sorting uh, environments, for example, there is little that the um, heuristic is contributing. But there are other cases, especially for distracted objects, that should not be part of the plan, where it's playing a large uh, role. So on average, this is the behavior that we, we were hoping to get. So as you increase the number of training problems on the x-axis, your mean time to solution for particular problems from this distribution of environments is uh, decreasing. So the planner responds faster, given limited planning time. Uh, and the percentage of problems that you can solve actually increases rapidly. Uh, and then it plateaus. So 
the follow-up question that we asked with Mohammed was, okay, this was this was good, but you're still spending 50 seconds uh, to solve, you know, uh, tabletop manipulation problems, and we we want to make it faster. We want to make it more practical. So. They're still slow. How can we make these planners a bit uh, more lazy? Uh, and how do we update these search, heuristic, uh, search heuristics online from, uh, from data so that they can, they can be refined to the particular problem setting that uh, you're facing? Um, and then the diagram looks quite a bit different. So let me, let me try to explain. So we, you start with uh, essentially um, a, a, set of, a set of facts which is the same as uh, previously, but now you're doing, you're keeping the same tree search uh, across the entire uh, session of adding new facts. This was not the case uh, when you were uh, when we were doing a PGL stream. In PGL stream, we were uh, doing a new tree search. We were growing a new tree every time we added a new logical fact, which is inefficient. It makes the problem simpler, but it's inefficient. So here, there is a single tree search. And instead of ranking streams, here we are actually ranking actions, logical actions. And then what that means is that the planner is aware, not aware, but the, the planner is, uh, ha has control over when streams are instantiated. So the planner is tailored for task and motion planning problems, has control over stream generation. It, it is not a black box uh, logical uh, planning type of uh, approach. And then, um, one of the other things that uh, was important was how to prioritize uh, which actions to take. Uh, we did that through this Levin tree search heuristic, which essentially prioritizes short and likely uh, PDL action sequences, where likelihood is measured according to your uh, PDL action policy. And this policy is being refined uh, according to runtime statistics that you're collecting while you're trying to execute these. Uh, actions in the uh, in the environment. So there is persistent research and uh, there is online adaptation. And this algorithm is called uh, lazy. So the more time we allow lazy, you know, the better it's doing uh, compared to uh, the adaptive uh, algorithm, but also compared to our previous work uh, as well on the same uh, type of environments. And we get the same type of graphs, but now, um, now you get much faster, um, much faster planning time. So now the planning time lowers to 10 seconds. And as the number of training problems increases, as your experience increases, planning time decreases. Uh, but again, the number of problems that uh, you can solve increases uh, with experience. And the flat line is essentially the uninformed version of the algorithm, which doesn't uh, leverage learning at all. So here is, here is an example of uh, type of tasks, you know, assuming perfect perception and uh, AR tags here. Uh, here are examples of running this algorithm with two arms to do bimanual uh, sort of uh, manipulation. We're gonna address the topic of perception a bit uh, later on. So looking back retrospectively at this work, um, uh, it's, uh, it made good progress, but I think uh, if I had to do this work again, uh, I think I would advise my students to actually formulate this entire framework in the, um, in the theme of uh, expert iteration. So in expert iteration, you have a fast reactive policy uh, which is trained, uh, is, is used to guide uh, a slow tree search algorithm which alternates and uh, locally improves the, the policy. So if you do this multiple rounds of heuristic training and tree search, you could potentially get you know, monotonic improvement guarantees for the policy, as well as converges to a point where the policy is as good as tree search. And um, I, I think the, the paper that really uh, made me think this is this dual policy iteration paper from One Sun, uh, which really formulates uh, the guarantees and the assumptions needed in order to have these two uh, results, so in order to have monotonic improvement. So I really, I really recommend that paper. Um, so moving on from, from these ideas of learning, uh, we also started looking at the other dominant theme of uh, task and motion planning solvers, which were, which were optimization based. So we, we created this algorithm called Stein, and, Stein Task and Motion Planning, or STAMP for short, 
Um, and the main ideas here are that instead of doing discrete and continuous optimization, uh, we relax the discrete search. We do away with the tree search completely. Uh, and uh, we turn TAMP into a continuous optimization problem. So this allows, uh, this allows us to um, essentially uh, run this framework fully on the GPU so that we can explore multiple solutions of the TAMP problem all at once. Uh, and in fact, we can do this in a sort of a probabilistic inference setting where we can get diverse uh, tasks uh, using this technique called Stein variational gradient descent. And in order to make this work, we have to, we, we don't have to, but we do rely on a differentiable physics simulator uh, written in NVIDIA Warp. And I'm happy to talk about uh, you know, some of the issues that uh, you know, we, we're facing when, when doing this. Uh, but the, the idea is the following. You have a set of particles. Uh, these, are, these represent action sequences. So these, these are relaxed task and motion plans. So they, are, they represent both the discrete and the continuous uh, actions. Um, you pass, you pass this through a differentiable physics simulator on the GPU, so all in parallel. And then you get a posterior set of particles, uh, which, uh, which do a better job at uh, coming close to uh, exploring local optima, multiple local optima. Uh, and this is done through this SVGD, Stein Variational Gradient Descent updates. Uh, this is what SVGD looks like when you have um, a, a loss landscape like this. So um, it's, a, it's a mixture of Gaussians with, uh, with three modes, and you're, you're trying, it doesn't need to be normalized, by the way. And you're trying to get particles to cover the different modes of, the, of this distribution. So given an unnormalized distribution, you can optimize particles to approximate uh, this distribution. The, the update term for these particles is essentially a combination of a weighted sum of gradients, weighted by some kernel, that makes these uh, particles go towards high probability areas of the, of the distribution, so go towards the modes. And the second term is a repulsive force that uh, makes the particles um, you know, go away from each other. It doesn't allow them to stay within the same mode. So this is the, the blue term is, uh, is therefore uh, imposing diversity. Now, the advantages of this are that um, it's easily parallelizable on the GPU. Uh, you can model multimodal uh, energy landscapes. It doesn't need to be a normalized distribution. Uh, and the disadvantages are that you have to, you, you have to manually specify a, a kernel and its hyperparameters, which becomes challenging in high dimensions. And there are, there's a lot you know, not, uh, not fully understood about this method on the theoretical front yet. So, uh, there's a lot of uh, discussions about whether these particles are actually sampling from, from the posterior or sort of covering the posterior. It's not very uh, clear yet. Um, but uh, we're talking about doing this in the discrete and continuous case. So what does SVGD for discrete variables look like? Um, so in this case, in this uh, animation, you can see that the particles are focusing on different modes of the distribution, but they're also changing color. And they're changing color according to the mode that they're in. So they can actually switch colors if they go from one mode to another. And the way this, uh, the way this is done uh, is that we transform the discrete distribution into a continuous distribution, so we relax it. Uh, effectively, this, in practice, this means turning the discrete variables into some uh, sigmoid uh, type of uh, uh, function. So now that we have this fully continuous, uh, now that we have this distribution over fully continuous variables, we can apply SVGD update on the surrogate distribution. However, since there is a mismatch between um, the actual distribution that we're trying to sample from and the, and the relaxed one, we need to uh, account for this mismatch using importance weights. So the update rule remains quite similar to the previous one, but there is an importance weight ratio that you have to account for. The other trick that um, you know, we, have to, we have to talk about in order to do this is, as you're going to see, most of these particles, if you, if you, turn them, if you let them evolve according to the SVGD rule, uh, they're happy to cover the, uh, the modes. But they don't actually go to the, to the peak of the mode. So, but that's actually the solution that we, we care about. So after a few rounds of SVGD, 
uh, we transition to plant refinement, which is regular uh, stochastic gradient descent in order for the particles to go actually to the, to the peak of the distribution and get you a, a local minimum or a local maximum. And this is, this is crucial. Without this, the technique doesn't, doesn't return useful plants. Um, so this is still ongoing work. Uh, so the, the examples that we have of this uh, are quite limited. Um, but I really like this uh, billiards case because it illustrates all the different ways that you can um, accomplish the task of getting the red ball into one of the holes while actually uh, hitting as many, um, uh, as many walls as you can uh, with a white ball. So for, for the white ball here, you hit no walls. That's, uh, uh, we have zero here if it hits one wall uh, and one if it hits the particular wall. So zero, 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 uh, four zeros actually doesn't hit any walls. Uh, zero, zero, one, zero is gonna hit uh, one wall. Uh, zero, one, zero, zero is gonna hit another one. So, so it's, uh, it's actually a way to get diversity in terms of uh, which, uh, you know, which walls the white particle is gonna, the, the white ball is gonna hit before it hits the, the, the red ball. We also have uh, block pushing type of examples where you can get this cube from A to B, but uh, actually pushing from different, uh, different sides. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the examples of this working stop here because of issues with the differentiable simulator, uh, which I'm happy to talk about later on. There are issues about computing gradients during contact. Uh, that's pretty much the only thing that is preventing this from uh, scaling up to, um, to, I guess, more long horizon type of uh, experiments for now. But we're trying to fix it. Um, all right. Yes. Question. Yeah, I think uh, like any other update rule, if you see uh, convergence in terms of the particles not moving very much, then you can transition. Any other questions? All right, so. Let's talk a bit about applications. Um, so we talk a lot about many of our robots being very useful in, um, in, in, the, in, in the kitchen and in our homes. Uh, and maybe your kitchen looks like this, maybe it doesn't. But I think an overlooked environment that I think deserves more attention is, uh, is chemistry labs. So chemistry labs are a bit more structured than uh, a home environment. But there are lots of problems in chemistry that would benefit from having robots uh, in there. For example, manipulating powders, manipulating liquids, granular materials, transparent objects, uh, optimizing the lab setup so that you can do experiments faster, uh, have high, higher throughput. So there's lots of um, interest from chemists about properly incorporating robotics in this, uh, in this workflow, where you have robots executing chemistry experiments uh, which are informed by some uh, optimal experiment design module uh, from machine learning. Um, and uh, th with uh, a number of very talented students and uh, collaborators, including Alana Sporuguzik, who's a chemist, uh, we asked the question, is there a role for general purpose robots in the chemistry lab? Can they actually help? Um, so we tried to show this by, uh, you know, show an existence proof. Um, so our goal was to uh, get excerpts from chemistry papers that have a natural language or semi-natural language of chemistry descriptions, process that into some sort of um, standardized chemistry description language that can be shared across multiple chemistry labs that describes the experiment, and then have, have task and motion planning, uh, have, sorry, first have perception that um, that can detect some of the objects that are relevant to the, to the task, but then have task and motion planning actually execute these uh, long horizon experiments, which are uh, recipes essentially, um, as you would have in the, in the kitchen. One of the things that we had to, to worry about when, when we actually deployed this is that since we're dealing with uh, liquids uh, and vials and things like this, 
we actually have to worry about uh, constrained motion planning and not, uh, not just worry, use unconstrained. But I'll let one of my students actually describe what this um, framework can, can do. Oops. Specialization experiment, an experiment fundamental for molecule synthesis. First, it preheats the water on top of the hot plate. Then it grabs the solute and pours it on top of the dish. It then grabs the hot water and pours it on top of the solute to dissolve it. The device stirs and heats the solution, and more water is poured until everything is fully dissolved. Once the solute is fully dissolved, the solution is allowed to slowly cool, and we obtain crystals. Ah. Okay, so here, afterwards, after we showed that this, you know, had a chance of working, um, it was last year, the beginning of last year. So everybody in the world uh, seemed like they were asking this uh, question, at least in the very narrow community that uh, we're in. So how can LLMs help with uh, planning? Um, and at the time, we were quite ambivalent about what to do with uh, LLMs, for, uh, especially in settings like this. And it seemed like the, the, the case where they would shine is in terms of uh, formatting the data from natural language to actually uh, more structured type of output. So we didn't use it for planning immediately. Uh, that has changed later on. But initially, we just used it for um, translating from natural language to this structured uh, chemistry uh, language, um, and in order to do th even in order to do this, we, we had to actually use syntax verification. Uh, so LLMs can translate this initial prompt of of an experiment into uh, an XML that uh, describes this experiment. Uh, but even even when we do this, we have to do multiple iterations and uh, check the syntax and also check the fact that it's referring to the right objects in the scene in order to actually uh, accept uh, the verified structured language description of the experiment at the end. So it's not just about applying LLMs. We had to put some checks and balances. Um, and we used, uh, yeah, we used LLMs. Uh, this is complicated, but we used LLMs in this way to uh, to give this structured uh, language description to the uh, to the TAM solver, uh, and the rest was similar to what we had done uh, before. We also did um, we also did this type of experiment where uh, we were trying to automate electrochemistry experiments. So um, these are experiments where you have an electrode and you're trying to figure out what material is best to use in this electrode. Uh, so after you're done with this, uh, after you're done polishing this electrode for six hours, uh, you have to put it in a uh, in a in a liquid uh, a bottle in order to measure. Uh, how well it uh, allows electricity to pass through. So in order to do this polishing, uh, you know, chemists spend a lot of time doing this, and it's super boring. They're, they, really, uh, they really don't want to do it. Uh, so it's good for a robot uh, to, to be able to do it. So that's what we, uh, that's what we did. And in fact, we had um, communication with the robot in natural language. Uh, we had automatic generation of the report of the experiment, sort of like an automated statistician uh, type of concept, uh, which was m taking the measurements and actually presenting some statistics about the experiment. So, um, so fully capturing all the elements of the, all the steps of the experiment. Um, but that's that's essentially where we're at now. And now we're talking about uh, planning versus uh, skills in that subgroup uh, of my collaborators. After having seen the success from TRI with uh, you know, low-level skill manipulation and even multitask uh, sort of uh, skills, we're left wondering, you know, what does that look like for the chemistry environment? Um, but uh, that's where we're heading towards for that project. But I think in general, if you take a step back, uh, we want to be able to uh, allow a bit uh, better perception for some of these uh, task and motion planning systems. So in particular, we want to 
allow open world perception where you don't have a fixed number of classes that your um, semantic segmentation module will, uh, will output. So together with uh, Krishna and uh, Antonio and Liam Paul at uh, Montreal and quite a few other students, uh, we had this paper called Concept Fusion, which um, does open set 3D semantic mapping. So each point in the 3D map contains the XYZ location of each point, the normal vector, uh, a feature vector, uh, and some confidence. So this, uh, this feature vector is the interesting part in the sense that we have all these pre-trained uh, computer vision models uh, that, are, that, sort of, that sort of operate at the image level. They do not operate at the pixel level, or at least they didn't uh, back at the time. So our approach was to actually uh, segment patches of the image and then evaluate these features uh, per pixel in addition to having a global uh, feature that characterizes the entire image. So once you have this type of uh, fusion of global and local features, you get, uh, you get these embeddings per point. And th these are pixel aligned embeddings. So the cool thing about them is that now you can get semantic segmentation in 3D and you can have, uh, you can have questions on top of this semantic map. For example, what is the distance between one object and the other? And then you can use a, uh, you can use a symbolic method to actually measure that distance to guarantee that you get the right response. So it's a, sort of a mixture of semantic 3D mapping plus uh, features for each point which allow you to make uh, queries quite easily. Um, one of my favorite examples is uh, being able to do multilingual queries of the map. Uh, so I can ask the map for a place to sit and relax in English, French, you name it. Uh, just, swap the, uh, just swap the encoder and everything else is the same because there's no fine tuning uh, done in this framework. We used this concept fusion um, system for essentially doing semantic segmentation and uh, object localization for manipulation. So if you tell the robot to push Baymax on the right, uh, it, can, it will do that. If you tell the robot, uh, and your robot happens to be a car, go to the roundabout, assuming you have a map of the environment, the car is gonna know what location you mean, so it's gonna go there. So this is more about task specification than anything. In later work um, called Concept Graphs, we, uh, we did a few other modifications which uh, computed features per object and not just per pixel. And now you can tell your robot uh, you know, to find you something related to space and it will find an NASA t-shirt. Um, Something to wear for a space party uh, will get you to that t-shirt. Uh, something that uh, Michael Jordan would, would play with, uh, you have a basketball. So there are all these semantic associations in the, in the map that, uh, that make task specification easy. My favorite part of this concept graphs idea uh, is essentially um, the ability to, to model, uh, you know, deformable objects and really understand the semantics behind uh, these, these objects. So the idea is when you do traversability estimation, if you want to ask, can I push this object and traverse through, the framework is going to say, yes, this is a deformable object. Uh, it's probably a piece of green fabric. You can proceed without, a da without damaging it. So that tells you that you can move some objects out of the way without actually colliding with these objects. And you can use the same framework in, uh, you know, for manipulation, for specifying which objects are, um, you know, are intended for the robot to, to manipulate. Right, so in terms of ongoing work and future uh, directions. So I've had a lot of conversations today about, uh, you know, what's the, what's the future of uh, foundation models and will, of VLMs replace everything and all of these uh, questions that you know, make us stressed. So um, I think LLMs, are they, designed, are they destined to replace task planners? Uh, the, I, I don't have a great answer for that, but I think they can definitely help as LLM plan, as, uh, as task planning heuristics. 
So if you wanted to use these uh, LLMs as part of a formal planning method where they suggest good plans, that's obviously doable. I think one direction that is not as obvious and I think it deserves a bit more attention is uh, actually planning in the, at the inference time when you're uh, generating uh, symbols from the LLM. So instead of just doing autoregressive sampling to generate paths, can you actually have search algorithms do sampling with look ahead uh, in the LLM so that you can generate more useful uh, sequences for some particular task? And this goes back to learning things like uh, A star heuristics or just learning planners on top of the LLM at, at test time. The other, the other direction that I think is worth uh, mentioning is you know, how to handle uncertainty in task and motion planning. So what is the information you gain by adding a new uh, symbol or learning a new skill? Um, I think this is a, quite a difficult question to, to answer because uh, we don't have uh, a very probabilistic definition of, uh, of, of task and motion planning for the majority of the literature. Uh, I think Tomas and Leslie are trying to change this. Um, but also, how do we handle uncertainty in 3D mapping? So we have semantic uncertainty about the classes of objects. We have geometric uncertainty. And we have uncertainty about physical properties. Uh, so how do we make, how do we enable robots to actually be able to um, minimize uncertainties at all, at all of these three levels uh, during their behavior, during their exploration? And I think, Aside from that, we need pre-trained models that you know, really give us uh, affordances of objects, not just at the API level. So if I say I want to interact with a fridge, it shouldn't be able, you know, the, the model should not be just telling me you can open a fridge or close the door of the fridge or put something in the fridge. It should be able to tell me which part of the fridge should I be interacting with uh, in general, and then maybe I can refine that into something more useful for my planner. Um, so we need to reason about object parts that are useful for uh, tasks, but not just whole objects. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll just stop. It's a bit early, but uh, I'm looking forward to discussions. Uh, and I'd like to thank many of the people uh, who collaborated with me and made this work uh, possible. So thank you. Fantastic. So we have time for a bunch of questions. Let's see who wants to get started. Okay, thank you for the talk. So you talked about uh, you know LLMs on one side, uh, fully discrete, fast downward kind of stuff on the other side, and the optimization in the middle. Do you think that um, anything in the Stein variational optimization um, well, do you think it scales to some of the combinatorial kind of problems that we are solving with the discrete solvers? Or are there any ways maybe to pull some of the discrete uh, solving capabilities of those solvers into the Stein kind of methods? Have you thought mm -hmm. about Yeah, I think scalability is, a, is an issue. Um, just from actually just forming the, the, the kernels that are going to compare all of these, uh, all, all of these paths. Um, it's, it's hard to talk about um, scalability in in that sense, because um, there are no guarantees in Stein, right? Uh, and you really need, not only do you need to scale, um, you really need to scale the number of particles as well in order to have some chance of visiting some mode. Uh, and it sort of assumes that you have some prior knowledge of uh, how to set that number of particles. So that's, that's definitely a weakness. Um, and the, the issue is that when you increase the number of particles, then the kernels become, that compare the distances of these particles, become a bit unwieldy. So you need to be able to uh, approximate those kernels in order to get similar behavior. So scalability is, is a definite issue. I mean, maybe the dual to that, do you think we need, I mean, are LLMs taking care of the really combinatorial uh, part of the problem? And maybe, you know, small branching factor problems we need to have planners that get through that, but we don't, they don't have to get to the really hard problems? Or do you think we need to keep working on the, the super combinatorial problems too? It's a good question. I think it really depends on what tasks are LLMs good for. I, I would really love to see uh, a study that compares uh, the performance of LLMs uh, with some of these um, cl 
classic planners, and there have been quite a few uh, uh, comparisons like this. Uh, but for the environments that we care about, so for, for, for kitchens, for uh, chemistry labs, for some typical environments that you might care about, it is definitely true that you can have, you can embed an NP hard problem in any domain. So I can, I can have, um, I can have, I can embed a, uh, a bin packing problem inside TAMP, and LLMs are not going to help me. Uh, also, if I start having multiple robots trying to coordinate with each other, I don't think LLMs are going to be able to help me either. Anything that talks about you know, coordination of multiple robots, uh, especially when it comes to scheduling, uh, you know, with, time, uh, with time guarantees and time constraints, I would love to see a study that actually defines the boundary of which, which part of the distribution LLMs are, are good for, so that we know whether the remaining part is actually worth covering with a discrete search or some other type of method. But we can, we can definitely construct scenarios like this. So anything multi-robot, I wouldn't trust LLMs for. Um, and anything NP hard, I wouldn't trust them either. So, thank you. Hi. Um, thanks. Great talk. Um, I have a question on the um, uh, speed up temp part. Yeah. So you are talking about um, you're speeding up by learning some heuristics from the uh, past planning experiences. So I think um, another way to um, speed up the process is to break the problem into uh, smaller pieces by having more hierarchies. Yes. Like for example, if, a, if, if the task is to cook a meal, that's a pretty long task, even if we have these uh, uh, learned heuristics. So have you thought about like having more hierarchies built in for the um, task motion planning? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we, we haven't done it in this framework, but I think um, one way you could do that is essentially having uh, either hierarchical policies or hierarchical ways to set, to inform some block of actions to be activated or optimized by another, uh, uh, by another policy. So you could do that. I don't think we've, uh, we've done it. Um, and I also wonder if anything in the logical specification would have to change if you were to sort of focus on uh, the segment-wise uh, completion of the task, or whether the same type of logic that you would provide um, would work in this case as well. Um. So I, I, don't, I don't know if it's, it's purely a search optimization issue or if you have to actually change your uh, specification as well. I think there are some frameworks like um, HTN or um, something that, uh, um, like HPN that Leslie and Tomas was working on. And I think that one, you need to change the um, uh, task specification task quite a lot so that um, your high level planner can consider those continuous constraints as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, I, so I'm curious, um, do you think um, we should, um, try to add more hierarchies or let's say using some something like stand variation to put that in one um, optimization framework i i, I don't think stamp is going to be able to hire these super long sequences where you know they can be accomplished in uh you know in in segments not not in the way that the framework is currently at um, but you, you could do something like blockwise optimization in order to focus on just a certain part of the task and ignore other variables. It's just a matter of knowing which, which variables you can ignore and which, which part you can still optimize. Um, I think for more hierarchy, it's, it's a bit difficult because in, in RL, for example, sometimes you have the, when you do hierarchical, hierarchical reinforcement learning, you have these issues where uh, the master policy and the uh, and the specialized policy uh, they become out of sync at some point, and you have to be very very careful about how to, how to update them. So I don't know if you get similar issues uh, issues here. I mean, you can you can certainly group a, a set of uh, states, logical states, as being 
uh, cluster them and then talk about going from one cluster to another and then try to refine. Uh, so maybe that's, that's one approach to, to this, but uh, I don't think it's straightforward. Thanks. Sorry, maybe a question on the perception side. Uh, sorry guys, I will go for this and then I'll pass it to you. Um, I feel that in many works, first of all, I'm a big fan of concept graph and concept fusion, like, you know, very cool works. I feel that you're st still treating geometry and semantics as decoupled things, right? Mm. We have the geometric reconstruction yeah, first, yeah. and then we kind of color yes, the, the yes. point cloud, like, you know, with features and so on. Do you think there is a fundamental question there? Is that enough, like, you know, maybe, like, you know, that do we need, like, you know, tighter coupling with physics, semantics, and geometry, or do we well, really care? Yeah, so, I mean, so in cases where you need features that describe local geometry, you definitely need features of the local shape. So that would have to somehow interact with, uh, you know, it would benefit from interacting with the texture of the object or the material and the appearance and the local shape. So it would be Even good the to semantics, have- semantics, right, I would argue. Like, yes, yes. That, right. Yeah, but it's just, we, we don't do it yet because there are these other things that we have to infer, like the material uh, of the object, and we, we don't do that at the moment. Do you think that will come up to training, like, you know, these aspects together? Do you have some insights about how to get to that point? I, yeah. Um, I, I think, so in inverse rendering, uh, people get uh, videos and they try to uh, decompose them and try to recompose them. So sort of analysis by synthesis. Uh, and in order to do that, you, one of the parameters that you have to figure out are some of these uh, materials, uh, material definitions, or um, shapes, or uh, anything that has to do with uh, how light is reflected, so mm -hmm. the BRDF definitions. So you could, you could do this uh, analysis by synthesis method and try to infer some plausible you know, set of materials that exist for this object. but. Uh, you know, if you wanted to do it from real data, but I, I don't know if that's uh, You're talking reliable. about test time, right? You would do this inverse problem at test time, like, you know, as you run? Or no, I'm, talking, I'm training. talking about training time. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, um, in your, your talk today, you seen graphs featured uh, in a couple of different places. And so for the, like, learning to uh, accelerate TAMP, um, it was important to include object relationships as well as um, kind of goal constraints on the, the actual like objects and the, the scene graph. And then um, later on when you talk about concept graphs, you talk about you know, modeling affordances and mm -hmm. um, or I guess this, this feature work. Uh, what do you feel is uh, really important to capture in these map representations and um, like what's the role of object relationships in these uh, mm -hmm. scene graphs? Well, I think, yeah, we, we talked about this quite a bit today, that it has to be, that it has to have some task relevance. But I, I still think having access to parts of the object or the ability to split the object apart into parts as needed, maybe as needed by the task or as needed in general without having any task reference, uh, would, be, would be useful. Uh, so that you can be very, very precise about which part of the object you're, you're, you're referring to. So, if I say uh, grab the microphone, it would be really nice to be able to to say that I'm not grabbing it from the top, but I'm grabbing it from the from the neck. Uh, so I, I think we do need these sort of part caption uh, systems uh, in order to facilitate talking precisely about uh, actions. Now, whether you know whether you you need other types of uh, relationships about objects, I think that's probably just learned from co-occurrence in the in the scene. Thanks. Thank you for the fantastic talk. Um, I was really intrigued and wondering if you can explain a little bit more on your idea of essentially long horizon queries mm -hmm. through the LLM. Would this require reasoning about what the LLM is likely to answer? Or are you thinking of this in a kind of um, active learning fashion where you figure out what is the most important question to prompt? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not fully uh, understanding the question. Can you formulate it another way? Can you elaborate a little bit more <coughs> on your idea of planning for longer horizon ah. queries instead of uh, autoregressively querying? Oh, I see, I see, I see. Right, so one idea to, to do this could be uh, that you want, you want to prioritize, so um, LLMs can generate sequences of 
you know, combinations of all the symbols that are possible, but with vastly different probabilities. So if you just sample, it's going to take a long time to actually find the sequence that you want. So if you wanted to sample with lookahead, one idea could be that the lookahead could be, uh, I want to impose the constraint that a word should be in there in the, in the generation. Or uh, I want to impose the constraint that some uh, word should occur before another word. So you can put some of these additional constraints and ensure that they are at test time and ensure that they are satisfied when you're sampling. And that sort of increases at test time the probability of sampling the sequence that you want. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, so when you talk about uncertainty at the end there uh, and perception, uh, I'm curious, we're used to dealing with you know, often uncertainty in like particular variables um, yeah. maybe for traversability, like um, you know, have some distribution or something. And you presented a potential alternative like the LLM base, like does this seem safe to move through? So I was curious, when you talk about going back to planning and TAM and, TAM and everything, uh, do you see like these kind of qualitative versus quantitative uncertainty or like risk assessments as complementary or or uh, I guess having different pros and cons? Or you mean, is the semantic uncertainty going to clash somehow with uh, uncertainty of uh, physical parameters? Or Yeah, I guess, like, what are your thoughts on, say, like, asking a LLM or clip or something, like, does it look safe for me to travel this route versus oh, yeah, other yeah. traditional methods? Oh, I didn't, mean, I, I didn't mean asking the model to, oh. to, to think whether it's safe. Uh, I, I was thinking more about estimating uncertainty from you know, either the model weights or the model outputs somehow. But uh, I'm, I don't mean ask the model to tell you how uncertain it uh, thinks the output is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I, yeah we shouldn't rely on that. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, do not trust yeah. LLMs for risk. So I'll start here. Like, the chemistry lab application. I mentioned that in the introduction, mm -hmm. I really believe that it's, it's very creative. Like, you know, and, uh, uh, it's the first time I've seen it. Like, you know, we, we discussed about that like mm -hmm. last year, but uh, it's good to see this in person. What do you think, like, you know, are the roadblocks there? Like, you know, when it comes to perception, like, you know, or temp, like, you know, what are the big problems that you need to solve there? Maybe it's a question about failure modes, I guess, that you yeah, have, yeah. you know. Uh, and also, like, I'm thinking about perception. I don't know, the first thing I'm picturing in my mind is that you have a lot of transparent objects. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the one, one of the major uh, problems is these multi-material interactions. So you have, let's say, powders interacting with fluids. Uh, and, you know, imagine tracking that or trying to predict the behavior of that. Uh, so these multi-material simulators are, are really, really interesting for that type of domain. That's, so perception in general is a, is a problem. Uh, I think a bigger problem is the fact that chemists think that all you need for chemistry labs is just pick and place so that you can move files from one station to another. And that's, that's a roadblock because they, they're satisfied with this level of automation. Uh, whether, whereas I think robots have a lot more to offer to them. It's just we need to find, uh, we need to define tasks. So the hardest thing about this collaboration with chemists has been to find the right chemistry task to work on. They, but by the way, they're, they're also very, very interested in optimizing the layouts of the labs and where to put the, the robots so that mm -hmm. they can do these experiments faster. But for them, that seems so far on the horizon that they're not seriously considering it. We're actually, you know, we could do it. It's not, uh, it, it's doable. Would it, would it be more about mobile manipulation type of thing or just distributed like, you know, settings with multiple robots? Yeah, I, I, yeah mobile manipulation is, a, is an interesting uh, uh, question. So. It would have to be mobile, but not having a mobile base on the floor. It would probably be mobile in the sense that you have like a linear actuator that moves the arm uh, on, a, on a particular uh, line. But you, you should also consider settings where you, where you put the, the arm in the ceiling and uh, you know, wh where, or, or whether you put it on the table. Uh, how do multiple arms uh, collaborate in order to use the same chemistry equipment? Uh, what's the scheduling problem on top of the TAMP problem that allows that uh, coordination to happen? So there, there are lots of opportunities. Um, and how to adjust all of these behaviors as the data from the lab is coming in. So having sort of a reactive, uh, fully autonomous lab um, with closed loop everything. Uh, that's, that's, very, that's very tricky. 
and we haven't even started talking about safety. Yeah, you know, yeah right? that's, do you envision like you know, humans being in that mix as well? Yes, yes. Yes, they have to. Beautifully tough problem, all right. All right, folks, so I think I really enjoyed the discussion. Thanks for, uh, for taking so many questions. Awesome. So let's thank Florian again. Thanks so much.